Hey everyone, what's up? Welcome to the Life Inner Show. I'm your host, Jason Wojo. On Life Inner Show, we help people make more, work less, and live a life they love. I am joined by my co-host, my partner in crime, best friend, Polish Peter Kolot. What's up, PPK? Hey, PPK. Oh, that's a new one. I haven't heard that one before. Well, it's PPK? like, a, I think there's a gun. Like there's, there's like the James Bond gun, I think was called a PPK or something like that. Some, something along those lines. Anyways, man. So, so yeah. Mm. So it has so a, I'm it, a man it does of have a ring mystery. Yeah, I'm I think man inter- international man of mystery yeah, has a ring That's to right. it. Yeah, there go with go. it. Go with it. I am international. Where we go? I know, I, maybe right. I should start doing that, branding myself that way. I'm international man of mystery. I think there's something to it. Bring it well, on. And, until then, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 push that podcast episode down the line for a little bit. Um, on this one in particular, we're going to talk with Doug Ottersberg again. Uh, we, if you remember, Peter, uh, Doug was a guy who we talked about with mindset, uh, self hypnosis. So Doug has this whole other side to him where his business side uh, is, is investing, in particular in mobile home parks, uh, which I thought is a really cool topic that I wanted to cover in the podcast because so many people are looking for stage four income. And if you're not familiar with the four stages of financial prosperity, this is a life inner thing. Go back to one of our earlier episodes to learn more about that on the Life Inner Show or go to the Life Inner app to learn more. Anyway, so stage four, your assets are working for you and not, and you're not working for money, right? Your, your, your assets are producing your, your, your finances for you, your income. And so mobile home park investing is something that appeals to a lot of people, but not a lot of people know about it, right? It's not like you don't just hear about this, like, Hey, let's, let's go buy a mobile home park. Right. And uh, you know, I'm curious about this particular episode because I didn't know about people investing in entire mobile home parks. Like you own the entire mobile home park, right? Yeah. Until I actually met Doug a while ago. And I think He's got a little niche that he carved out for himself that has been obviously benefiting him tremendously. And he's been able to hit stage four. And I think if I'm not mistaken, he said that he hit stage four after the first mobile home park yeah. he purchased. Yep. So this should be an interesting episode for you to listen to if yep. you are looking to get to the stage four and they're looking for different ways to do that. Yeah. So let's jump right onto it now. It's a, it's a great interview and I can't wait for you to learn about mobile home park investing. Here we go. Hey, Doug, welcome to Life Inner Show, man. Thanks for coming back. Great to see y'all again. Good to be here. Awesome, man. Well, hey, listen, you know, we touched on this briefly in the last episode and we didn't have a whole lot of time to get into it, but I know that our listeners are curious, especially as they are looking for investments to take themselves out of their nine to five or whatever job or thing that they're doing to, to generate money and start to look forward towards investments. And, you know, in Life Inner, we talk about these stage four investments. And one of the things you have done in your life and is, has done mobile, po- mobile home park investing. Now, how long have you been doing that? 26 years. 26 years, man. Gosh, no kidding. Did you start off with just mobile homes themselves or did you go right into parks? Actually, I did. Um, we, we found out about this after going to a lot of different seminars and uh, living in LA at the time, uh, I was dating my now wife. And we uh, ended up buying a mobile home about two hours north of LA, bought it and, and sold it. And then, um, then we just bought a park. <laughs> so, so hold on a second. So you went from one mobile home to buying a park. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> um, and I would say it was definitely the hand of God. Uh, we were in a room of, uh, investors, you know, at a class seminar, and we had been to that particular group uh, multiple times. And the leader uh, recently uh, passed away. His name was Jimmy Napier. And one of the things Jimmy would do was he would allow people to sign up, and you could go up to the front of the room, and he called it haves and wants. I have this, or I want that. Um, and after a couple of meetings. I was uh, bold enough to sign up and go stand up in front of the room and, and made a comment to the effect of, hi, my name is Doug Ottersberg. At a recent meeting here, I was told I wasn't a tree. Um, I could invest wherever it made sense or I could actually move somewhere where it would make sense. And I want to buy a mobile home park and I will go wherever that deal is. And it turned out that there were some uh, investors from Albuquerque and one of them was a broker. Uh, when he got back to Albuquerque, he uh, put an ad you know, out in like the Thrifty Nickel or whatever it was at that time. And long story short, he, 
he built a seller's list of mobile home parks, called us up, and we, I flew over and looked at a bunch of different mobile home parks and made an offer on one and it got accepted. <laughs> and there we went. And man, so, so how does one, first of all, you know, um, this is a completely foreign investing concept for a lot of people. A lot of people can think of like, okay, I, I know how to buy a single family home, maybe even sure. how to buy a mobile home. But how do you, how does somebody buy a mobile home park? First of all, is this, are you doing direct mail to park owners or are these listed somewhere like on LoopNet or something? Like how are people finding these? They are listed. LoopNet uh, is, is one place. Mobile home park store is another. Um, these days there are a lot more people looking uh, for these investments. And so just like with pretty much everything else out there, uh, the best deals are not listed. Okay. And the best thing that I, uh, the best advice I have for you, if you're watching right now, and this is something that interests you, is go ride the speed bumps. <laughs> and what does that mean? Uh, get in your car and go drive around and start looking for a uh, mobile home park, uh, if that's what interests you, uh, in, your, in your area. And just start seeing and educating yourself uh, what the different properties look like. Uh, and, and, and what we're typically looking to do is find, find the manager or find the owner even better and uh, position ourselves as, you know, just someone that's interested in the business. And especially if it's an older, like mom and pop type operation, um, position yourself as someone like, hey, you know, so how long have you been in the business? And it's, it's about talking, right? And how long have you been doing this? Is it something you would recommend to someone, you know, starting out or how'd you get into it? And just start building relationships. And uh, that's, that's really what we have done for pretty much every community that we've bought. Hmm. Is, hmm. is literally just almost, almost the equivalent of door knocking a, a little bit, except yeah. the mobile home version. Uh, yeah. And, and those make the best acquisitions. I can't tell you the number of direct mail pieces I get <laughs> from, we buy mobile home parks, cash. I'm like, yeah, right, sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> right. So listen, so I got a couple questions for you from that just popped into my head from your talking. So first question is, yeah. why would somebody want to buy a mobile home park as opposed to let's say just a mobile home? Sure. And two, you said drive them around. So if I am, you know, you give me, you say, okay, this is why you should buy them. And now my next question is like, so what should I be looking for when I'm driving around? Perfect. So uh, there, there are two things that my mentor, Jimmy Napier taught me that a mobile home park is ideal. Now, Jason mentioned stage four income and that relates to this. Learn to make money work for you or spend the rest of your life working for it. And so by learning how a mobile home park operates, uh, you will be able to put yourself in a position to do that. So for example, the first community that we purchased back in 1994 is a 42 unit community in Santa Fe, New Mexico. At the time, each of those spaces was paying, I, let's say around $200 a month. So multiply 42 times uh, 200, right? So $8,400 a month. Then what you'll find is in general, not always, some more, some less, it takes about 30% of that income to run the property, to pay the taxes and the insurance and the sewer and the water and the trash. And then after that, you've got your debt service if, 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 if you haven't paid cash for it. Put it this way, we purchased that community back then for $595,000. So assuming, let's just round up, let's say $600,000. Now, the way that those communities are valued is on their income. 
So you add up all the income for the year, subtract out your expenses, and after that, whatever's left over, you as the buyer decide, well, what type of a return do I want on, on my money? Mm-hmm. How, what type of a return should this investment be making? So in, in, in our example here, let's say 10%. That's our benchmark. A business that's returning 10%, if after I pay all my expenses, I have $60,000 left over, mm-hmm. If I divide 60,000 by 10%, I come up with $600,000. That's the value of that community. Okay. And so after, after, after the deal was done, I don't remember the exact numbers. However, I do know this. I had sold our biz, my business. I had had commu- a computer maintenance company in Los Angeles. And I was recently married, newlyweds. And when we bought that mobile home park, there was enough money there for us to live on without having to go to the J-O-B every day. So in the words of uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the moment we bought that community, we quote, exited the rat race. And two, we got to stage four, where the money was working for us. That's number one. So, The properties are valued on its cash flow. Number two. And Doug, so so you're saying you're using the capitalization rate as your, as how, okay, yep. Cap rates and cap rates can be your friend when you're a seller (laughs) uh, in times like right now. Cap rates are ridiculously low. Um, There's just so much money looking for yield, looking for return, that people are, are, are bidding these properties. When the cap rate goes low, it's an inverse relationship. The, the price goes high. And so right now, um, we are utilizing the, uh, the second thing that Jimmy taught us, which was um, some part of each day's work should benefit you in the future. Again, some part of each day's work should benefit you in the future. So when, when we first bought that mobile home park, um, guess who bought a pair of overalls? <laughs> guess who learned how to, how to work a manually powered earth mover, also known as a shovel? Um, <laughs> uh, that was me. And yeah, I was out there working every day. Um, and yet, Over time, one of the neat things about income properties is the fact that um, it's all based upon that, what they call the net operating income. That's what's left over after you pay your expenses. So think about this. If you have opportunities to raise the income and lower the expenses, you increase that net operating income. And the nicer you make the property, and as you clean it up, and you make that cash flow uh, and your, your P&Ls look really good, then that, it presents a more valuable cash flow stream. And within seven years, Anna and I, my wife and I, were able to refinance that property, and we did a cash out refi of more, we got more cash out than we paid for the place in the first, uh, to begin with. So imagine how cool that feels. Yeah, I worked seven years and yet taking your family out to lunch and putting a check for over a half million dollars in your toddler, in your like five or six year old kids hands. (laughs) And they're like, that was mom and dad too. (laughs) So you're the kid who's getting that check? Right, right. That's what Anna says. (laughs) <laughs> what um, so Doug? What what was it though that appealed to you? I mean, you you wanted to do some sort of investing. You wanted your money to work for you. What is it specifically yeah. that appealed to you about mobile home parks? So what what really appealed to me, uh, guys, is the fact that at that moment in time, I was also reading uh, Sam Walton's biography. And if you're familiar with the yeah, story Walmart. of Walmart, yeah. Walmart um, they grew by serving 
uh, the, the folks out in the smaller towns. And when I was looking at real estate investing, in general, I said, you know, that's kind of cool. Um, go out to you know, maybe smaller towns. And then at the same time, uh, I realized that, you know, there were a couple of different ways of making money. Typically, there's the uh, high volume, but real low margin. Uh, you can do a lot of deals, but you make a little bit on each one. Well, that kind of sounds like wholesaling, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like flipping. Um, and to me, that sounded like me working as opposed to money working. And so I'm like, okay, well, what else is there in business? There's also the high margin, but low volume. And well, that could be what we're used to in maybe rehabbing. You don't do as many, but you make more. But that's still work. I'm like, well, what would it take? You know, I'm going to look for an asset. I can buy the asset and let the asset work, and I'm just going to manage it. So what is that? That's multifamily. Those are uh, mobile home parks. Those are apartments, uh, businesses, those types of things. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, multifamily housing has advantages in that if I want to build true wealth, because I looked around, and at these meetings, it seemed like the, the people that had the, the most money and the most freedom were the ones that owned stuff. And, and, and probably had owned stuff, real estate uh, businesses for a while. And so that was where my mentality was at the time. And I thought to myself, gosh, you know, if you're looking for properties to buy and rent and to get someone else to pay it off, and if you apply the um, high margin but low volume, those could be the expensive like executive type uh, houses or on the other end you've got the low margin but high volume and I thought about that and I said you know what there are always going to be more people that need affordable housing than there are on the other on the other side of the spectrum got it and so when I when I was thinking about this I'm like oh okay so if I go look at that area at the time the mobile home parks made a lot of sense how much did you how much weight did you give to some of the stereotypes of like these tenants typically being harder to deal with in terms of like they're, they're you know they've made maybe perhaps their income is more compromised or there are there are some i think some stereotypes that they handle money not quite as well and so therefore maybe more prone to default things like that or was that a concern have you found that to be true or is that actually completely a myth uh for the most part it's a myth and a lot of it has to do with uh where you are uh you know geographically and um uh, I'll just share again, Jason, this first community, uh, there is no way I could have planned and calculated and set a goal and ended up owning this community in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> I was sent here, literally. Um, and what I find is even now in the depths of the, the COVID challenges that we've all been having, our, our residents, have been paying rent and over 26 years um what we have found again management is is important but for the most part most of our residents are really good people and they're just like us and they want to go out and work and come home and have a, a place that they can relax in and and you know feel good about their kids playing outside well, dude, and I'm glad to hear you say that. And I, I, I love that you said that because, you know, sometimes I realize, first of all, especially now, um, there's, we, we stereotype people so, so, so quickly, but also some of these people just want simplicity in their lives. They just want, uh, you know, especially we've seen this, this surge in small homes and things like that. And people maybe just want to live simply and they just don't want the big expensive house and, and, and like they've, they're, they're looking at like keeping their budget low, their overhead, yep. uh, just, you know, and so this is, this has nothing to do with financial irresponsibility. It's just personal choices. Um, Absolutely. yeah, I love that. Peter, you had something you wanted to add. 
Yeah, I got a question because I'm kind of, I'm totally new to this. So I'm kind of ignorant questions, I guess. But so mobile home parks, is it all rentals or some of them owned or is it mixed or how does that work? It depends. So for example, we have uh, our community here in Santa Fe and it was built probably in the 60s and 70s and it was not engineered. In other words, it doesn't have exactly 50 by 100 foot lots with you know curvilinear streets and a nice subdivision feel, not even close. So we ended up, when we first bought it, uh, all of the residents owned their own homes. And you know, going back to Jason's point just a minute ago, um, yeah, there are some people who don't want to be a good neighbor. And when we identified who they were, we gave them an opportunity to become a good neighbor. And when they decided that they would rather not, we assisted them to expand their housing opportunities. Assisted them. Bye -bye. I like that. And at that point, one of the ways that we assisted them was quite often we would buy their home. And truth be told, one of the reasons we started looking at mobile home parks is Jimmy Napier wrote a book called Invest in Debt. And it's all about how to buy discounted paper, notes, mortgages. Um, and, and that leads you into, well, gosh, if I can't find any to buy, why don't I just create my own? And so the, the whole idea of buying a mobile home or a house and then turning around and selling it on owner financing, get that whole thing a little, do a little work today that will benefit you in the future mm -hmm. um, and get money working for you. Both of those, you know, you check the box. Well, when I first tried to do that, I came home one day and I told Anna, it's like, man, it's like these mobile home park owners it's, it's like they treat these parks as their own personal playground and they won't let me play. <laughs> so I need to buy my own playground. So um, we ended up over the years buying some of the homes and in our market, it's a really good business. Yes, you have to work. Yes, you have to maintain it. And it's like an apartment. You have to do the rehab and those kinds of things. Um, yet, it has been a blessing, not only for us and for our residents, because we maintain our prices. Uh, we could get a lot more. Uh, we don't. So we have a mixture here in Santa Fe of uh, rentals. Our main goal, though, is for people to own their own home because they just make better residents. When they have equity and they own their own home, uh, then there's a lot less work for us to do. All we have to do is collect the rent and maintain the common areas. So, um, so if I, if the park, mobile home park is majority people who own those homes. Yes. How do you make money? I mean, I feel like they on the lot. Rent. He rents the lots to them. Okay. So a mobile home park, folks. If you're if you're just new to this, like when you buy a house, that house is sitting on a lot that has been subdivided from a larger piece of land. Um, and you pay your taxes on that legal description. When you, most mobile home parks, manufactured home communities, again, it's one legal description. It's all plot of land. It's divided into lots where you rent each of those lots to a home owner and they pay you to park their home there. Okay. So, so if you have somebody who's renting, right? If it's a rental home, you're almost like double dipping. Yes. So on the rental homes, they pay us one price. Part of that goes to the community to, for the space. And then part of it goes into, uh, you know, the entity that owns the home. Uh, so. so you, so I just want to repeat what I think I understood, which was you actually prefer you, you own the land, you're charging lot rent to everybody, whether or not yep. they, whether they own the home or you rent it to them. And your preference for this kind of second version of income, the second source of income is to sell on owner financing to those people 
uh, yes. the house. And so there's a, so there's probably, it's probably, it's, it's probably like a standard lease option where they're putting down option consideration or something along those lines. And then they over, and then you're financing the note for them or something or, or yeah. the, the standard financing. These days, um, thanks to our, uh, wonderful folks in, in Congress, um, in order to sell, even with owner financing, if you do more than like one or two, each state is different. Oh, you, Dodd Frank, huh? You got it. Yeah. I don't like to kind of like Baltimore. But I don't like to say those names. <laughs> 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 That's case, why you said wonderful people in Congress. Okay, got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to have a mortgage loan originator's license or work with one. Um, but yes. Uh, it, my goal is to get our residents and the people that we serve equity um, because a res residents with equity, uh, uh, they're just a diff they, they're different. Right. Uh, and when it comes time for them to, to, to want to, not everyone wants to do this, but yet if they, if they want to buy a house, uh, house, uh, having pay, bought and paid for their manufactured home, their mobile home, A, they've, they've done something um, and proved to themselves that they can make these payments, but now they have an asset which they can sell. And well, not a lot of people have the cash, but we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what kind of, that makes a lot of sense, man. I mean, especially if someone owns something, they have skin in the game, they have a vested yep. interest in making sure the quality of the park is maintained or improved. They want good neighbors. They want people taking care of their lots. And, and so I can see the value in that. In regards to the finances, say someone's starting to get interested in examining mobile home parks. Um, first of all, what kind of cap rate like is like what, what, what is appealing to people in that niche? Like, so for instance, we've talked with investors uh, on the show who have done things from apartments to uh, storage and, and we're seeing, yeah. you know, different, different kind of cap rates. Like what is, what is something that attracts your interest? What, what is it? What's an average return with a little bit of work that someone can get out of a mobile home park? So the answer is it depends right, right now. Of course. <laughs> right now, as I said, there's so much competition uh, and there has been for the last couple of years. And I, 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 I do see that changing. All right. Um, I think you're familiar with uh, Anna and I uh, la a year ago in July, we were going through this, this challenge where we had an offer and I, I'll just call it a godfather offer <laughs> uh, to sell one of our, communities, one of our mobile home parks. And that was not, that's not our business plan. We don't buy things with the eye of how fast can we sell this and make a buck. We buy things that we're going to go in and we're going to do like we said earlier, we're going to identify places where we can increase the income. And then we're going to identify things that we can do to eliminate expenses um, and, and increase the value. Well, there has been, again, so much money chasing so you know, like little inventory. When we got this offer, we looked at it and we looked at each other and we're like, wow. And we, we prayed about it. We spoke with our friends in Life and Air and in our groups and, and different things. And we ended up selling it. Um, now, I look at, at a... 10%. Why? Because it's super easy. Um, and it, it, if you're, if you're listening to this, if you search Google, I don't know if it's still out there. It may be, I wrote an article a long time ago called turning trailer courts into communities. Um, and perhaps I could dig that up and send it to you, Jason, and maybe you could you know, link to it. It still might be out there. Um, but I talk about, you know, like the back of the napkin type of, you know, valuation. And 10% is really easy to, to use as a calculation. When we sold last time, this last community, I think it was about a seven cap. And I wouldn't buy at a seven cap, personally. Um, 
but then I don't have hundreds of millions of dollars I need to place either. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and to that point, Doug, one of the things like, and I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. You mentioned you kind of look for a value add, meaning you're looking for operational inefficiencies somewhere where you can in either increase income or decrease expenses, ideally both even. So yeah. if you do that, the cap rate will also increase too. So you, if I'm understanding this correctly, you could buy something at an eight cap and then you turn around operations, make more money, and all of a sudden in, in two, three years, it's a 10 cap, right? So backwards, uh, you, could, you could, as the cap rate goes down, the, the value, the price goes up. So you, you theoretically could buy something at, at, a, at, a, at a nine or a 10, clean it up, improve it, improve the cash flow. So the value's find, more. It, and it, the, you know, it'll praise for more, the value's higher. Then you find someone who has a lot more money that just wants to put their money to work. They're willing to accept a lower rate of return, i.e. cap rate. And, Got and, it. and then, so you buy it at a higher cap rate and sell it at a lower cap rate. Gotcha, gotcha. Are you, now, is traditional financing still available for mobile homes or is that a thing of the past? For mobile homes or the parks? For the homes, for your people that, so like can, for, for you to sell um, to, a, to a tenant who wants to buy, yeah. uh, does it have to be owner financing or can they get finance from a bank? Oh, they can. Okay. Uh, in most areas, we find that it's best that they go to a credit union. Okay. Uh, local, local, again, local community-based lenders, credit unions typically, uh, we find that those are the best lenders. And there are national lenders, for example, um, Triad is a national lender, uh, 21st is another one. So th they're out there. And but yeah. And I'm assuming like when you, when you buy a park, um, I'm assuming seller financing is also something you're trying to pursue, I guess, as well, if you buy it from somebody. Um, yeah. Is that something you have experience with? Every community that we've bought, uh, we've done with, with owner financing. Got it. And, Got it. And so, we, yeah, we're, 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 we're looking, again, we're looking for typically, and, and I'm not always looking, but it, it does, it does uh, seem to be that we have bought communities from an owner that would like to like now not do the work and just collect a check every month. And then, so we pretty much position ourselves as the answer to that, uh, where, Hey, we're, we're younger. We're willing to work hard. We're going to make sure you get paid every month because, uh, at some point I want to be like you. Um, and, and I want to be in your position. And they like that. And it's yeah. not, and it's not just a line. It's true. <laughs> and I'm getting to that point. <laughs> so <laughs> you're that guy. <laughs> I am that guy now. <laughs> so I got a question for you, Doug. Um, can you yeah. give us an example? Because I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Give us an example of a typical, I don't know if there is a typical deal, but typical deal on how they're like, you know, one and got it for this much, there's so many units, and this is what I'm making, that kind of stuff. So, one way that you could think about this is, like we said, you'll hear people talk about, you know, this property sold at a specific cap rate. Mm -hmm. That's one way. Another, another way that people will do it is, like, per unit or per, per door. All right. So I happened to look at a deal a, a friend of mine was look, looking at investing in. Um, and overall, they were buying. Uh, so this deal was buying a portfolio. I think it was three or four communities in a couple different cities. Overall, the community had high vacancy. So you have to ask yourself, uh, what's wrong with this community? Why does it have such high vacancy? Is it that people can't work? Is it poor management? Uh, 
you know, what is it? And in this case, the owner, the people that were buying the properties looked at it and they believed it's, it's because these owners were just collecting the money and they didn't really care. Um, and so one business plan is you would take over that community and you would buy it and then you would start bringing in homes and then selling them uh, with owner financing or with lender financing. And, and I looked at that and, and in this case, in those markets, overall, they were paying about $18,000 per unit. Now they were, they were paying what I considered to be a pretty low cap rate for the existing cash flow. Let's say they were paying 7% for the existing cash flow. Well, when you look at it initially, you're like, man, I wouldn't pay 7% cap for that. But they're looking at it and they're saying, well, with our business experience and what we know and what we can do, overall, we're only paying $18,000 per unit. And if you look at recent sales, what if full parks running really well, we're, we're, we're selling for 35,000 a, a space or 40,000 a space. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You could end up paying a low cash cap rate for existing cash flow, but then you're looking at it and you're like, Oh, well, there's a lot of vacancy. Um, you can fix I know it. That I, I can fix the vacancy issue. Yeah. I know what to do. I know where to find homes. I, I can work with the manufacturer. I can, I can go raise money, um, and, and buy that and bring it in. And, um, so there are a, a lot of different things to consider. So what are, what are some of the disadvantages? Are there any disadvantages of, of that you found specific to mobile home parks? Like one thing, for instance, yeah. um, and I don't know if this is true. This is totally just anecdotal observation that I've noticed. It seems like some jurisdictions, at least around here, have started to crack down on mobile home communities. Like they consider them eyesores and they want to get them out of there. Uh, is that, is that just, I guess it depends on where you are, but like, are there any disadvantages to mobile homes? investing parks in parks i would that i i think of and that is um uncooperative or um ineffective government mm. and uh again i go back to what jimmy napier taught me when i was uh first starting out the yay no tree y'all can move <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Doug, um, I have no idea what you meant by that. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't no tree. I was complaining at the time. It's like, you know, I think these mobile home parks, they, I can see the numbers. It makes sense. It sounds like a really good investment. I don't think that'll work where I live. And no real estate teacher has ever heard that excuse, right? right. It won't work where I live. Um, and he just kind of smiled and shook his head and he said, well, you ain't no tree. You can move, go somewhere <laughs> where it Got will it. work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or remember the post service, the, the postal service will bring you a check wherever you live. In other words, go invest somewhere where it will work. Um, and then, you know, have someone manage it and send you a check. So that's a disadvantage. Yes. Um, the other disadvantage that I have found is that you have to be in the right place at the right time because most people know what they have and they don't sell very often. They don't come up for sale. Like when you want, when you decide I want to buy one, um, there, there might not be much inventory. So I go back to building relationships with the owners of the communities in the areas where you would like to invest. And you want to be top of mind when it, when it's time for them to sell. When is that um, happen? It happens when mom and dad want to retire and a lot of the, the kids don't want the property or somebody passes away. All of the same reasons why when you buy single family homes or anything else that cause people to want to sell, it comes down to their situation has changed and you want to be the person they think of when that occurs. That so, makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. And then I love, I love that it kind of does circle right back to what we first started with, which is make the rounds, uh, let people know who you are, 
stay abreast yep. of developments and just stay in touch with people. Um, yep. When somebody is looking for a park, are there certain criteria that they want to be looking for as far as either number of lots or certain like, hey, this one has has its own like community well in septic versus city or like those kinds of things? So, yeah, typically um, our communities are like 40 units and above. And that just happened like from up to like a hundred. So below a hundred, uh, most people can handle with, with the rents where they're at today, unless you've already got a big wad of cash, you're probably looking at 50 units or less. Um, so the first, as far as size goes, it just depends on how much cash you can get your hands on for a down payment. Um, second thing is preferred. Yeah. Preferred is city water, city sewer, uh, depending on what area of the country you're living in. If you have natural gas, it's preferred that the gas company own the gas lines and the meters and they bill the customer directly. Same thing with electric, the local electric company should own, you know, the meters and bill the residents. Um, so that's, that's, that's preferred. One thing I have found is the, the very first community that we bought is on a well. And it had recently connected to city sewer. Now, one thing I know is that there are a lot of buyers, if it's not connected to city water, if it is on a well, they won't look at it. So, oh, well, if I'm just looking to get started, would I buy something on a well? If there were more of those available and I could, it gave me an opportunity. The answer is, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what did it take? I had to go sit for a number of days at a class and then regurgitate everything I just learned to get a well operator's permit. Um, and then what does that mean? Well, I am now the operator, but in this type of a system, pretty much if there ain't like, okay, what happens to it? There's no water. Call the well guy. <laughs> um, so somebody else does all that. Every month there's testing that has to be done. Guess what? Call the testing guy. Um, so I'm the director and whenever there's any work that needs to be done, we, we call someone and they do it. Got so it. that's a niche. Uh, if, if you're willing and, and, you, and you have to, that, that's something I would look at. I do my best to, to stay away from properties that have septics or their own on-site treatment plant. That's a lot more work than I want to get involved in. And yet, if you need to, to get started, that's up to you. Right, right. Any other advice for somebody that's learning this business, either in what to look for or where to learn more about this, about this industry? So uh, what to look for. Some of my best advice was as you're driving through the communities, um, I call it riding the speed bumps. <laughs> um, as you're driving through, just look at the community. You know, is it well kept or is it a, is it a, you know, does it need some work? <laughs> um, and the other thing, I, I, I like to see pickup trucks in the driveway and I like to see pickup trucks with tools in it. And why is that? Because my experience has shown that if there is work, most of our residents will work. And we have found that to be true over the last 26 years. I'm not going to use the words recession proof. Yet, we really don't notice uh, the economic cycles like some businesses do. And so, um, I would be looking for evidence that the residents there uh, are willing to work if there is work to be had. I will say, Jason, no one could have predicted COVID, where there, where there actually isn't work for them to go to. Um, and yet, I don't know how they're doing it. 
We've only had a couple of residents that have not been able to pay rent. The majority of them have paid rent throughout this whole episode. And so, you know, we made it clear to them, if you're having problems, please let us know. We'll, we'll help you out however we can. We'll do whatever it takes. Um, so that's, that's something I would be looking for. And, and then I would be looking for opportunities. Um, but you only, you can only see that, you know, when you start looking at the numbers. <laughs> right. Right. And then for somebody who wants to learn more about this, where, uh, either, I know you don't, you, you don't specifically teach this, I believe. Um, you learned, you mentioned Jimmy Napier, like, uh, is who else, where else can somebody learn about mobile home investing and buying parks, so, things like that? Um, there is a, I believe they're still doing it. Uh, there is a course and a boot camp offered by uh, Frank, Wolf, and Dave. Uh, if you go to mobilehomeparkstore.com, uh, okay. they do, and they have boot camps and such. Okay. Uh, and, you know, there have been folks that have uh, stopped out, you know, when they're in the area, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Albuquerque, hit me up. <laughs> um, come on out and. Yeah, I used to sell a course. I would go around and talk to real estate investing groups and clubs and, and you know, do, do the whole thing. And haven't done that for quite a while now, though. Is it, is, can, it, can someone pick that course up anywhere or are those all discontinued? You know what? Um, I might have some. And if, if um, it's something that you're interested in, you want me to, I might look and see if I have some. Uh, yeah, man. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, we can let, uh, I would say we'll, we'll just put your, uh, your email address in the show notes or something and people can, people can find yeah. that if you want. They can hit me up. And if I, okay. I, I do believe I have some left over from the last time we taught the course. Yeah, man. So, I, I, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to hit you up for one of those too. Well, Hey man, okay. I, I thank you so much for being on the, on the, on the show again. Um, we didn't have a chance to talk about mobile home and park investing on the first one. And I know this is more than anything. This is probably wet people's appetite. I know we kind of blasted through as much as we could here while respecting everyone's time. So I want to thank you for being on the life and our show, man. My pleasure. Anytime. Have a good one. See you later. Bye bye. Dude, that was cool, man. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about mobile home park investing. And uh, I think, you know, quite frankly, he made it sound, I mean, he made it sound easier than I would have expected, but also at the same time, he did say that like, Hey, it is kind of hard to pull one of these down because you got to pound the pavement a little bit. There's not a lot of people that are just raising their hand wanting to sell mobile home parks. Which this could be an actual opportunity because if you think about it, when it comes to investing, right? One of the most famous ones is single family housing. Yeah. Everybody's kind of doing it, right? This could be a nice little niche where since not a lot of people are actually posting about it and you start creating relationships like he's talking about and getting behind the scenes, you might be able to find some really good deals that way. Well, dude, that's a great point. And also like the fact that people aren't raising their hand trying to sell these things tells you something about the performance of the asset. Like people are act there's actually, they like it or they're doing well at it or it's meeting their needs. And so they're, why would they raise their hand? You know, however, when things happen, I loved what he said, like when things happen, you kind of want to be the go-to guy that they think of when they want to liquidate, when they want to sell or get out for whatever reason, whether it, and the motivation is kind of the same thing as we see with any other investment. It's the motivated seller who has life circumstances or a challenge or an issue or, or they're tired or they're old or they want to move down to you know, the villages in Florida and retire or something. And so, uh, yeah, I love, I love this approach there. I also found it interesting that some of the analysis of this is there's a lot of similarities between mm -hmm. other investment strategies. Like for instance, um, we've talked with Mike Wagner about self storage investing, and he also talked about cap rates. And so we're seeing some of the same themes that I hope our listeners are seeing as well. And like, how do you screen these deals? What are some of the numbers you want to look for? Um, and I also love like in, in this particular investment strategy, you know, it, Doug seemed to blend this uh, desire. I love how he decided he wanted to do this. He blended this desire for providing um, housing to, a, to a affordable housing to people, but also the fact that he has this um, recession proof, well, recession resistant business, it kind of checked all the boxes for him. 
Yeah. And I you know I think that's important basically what you just said about having some heart behind it because any kind of business that you're going after, if you don't have some heart behind it, it's gonna be pretty difficult. Especially he said, what did he say, twenty five years now? He's been doing this. Yeah, like yeah, over twenty five yeah, years, yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. So you gotta have some heart behind it to help people and all the kind of things. One big takeaway that I've gotten out of that particular episode, which we I don't think we actually dove into because we didn't have the time, but so many other opportunities to create cash flow from these properties. Like we just talked about one, actually two. One is the actual piece of land and two, if you're renting it out. But if you really think about it, I think that when it comes to mobile home parks, there are so many different ways to actually create cash flow. I'm sure he probably does some of that uh, that we didn't even get touched to because you think about it, you got utilities, you got all kinds of stuff that's happening on those parks, right? Uh, association. I don't know if they do the associations kind of a thing, uh, like they do regular subs and all that kind of stuff. But it's a really interesting uh, cash flow model, and to be able to get you to stage four, if you are looking for that kind of a vehicle, this might be a good option to look into. Yeah, man. Um, and it's it, like I'm glad we did the interview because it is something that I think not a lot of people know about. And if you know, maybe maybe mobile home park investing isn't even for you. But I hope one thing that maybe perhaps this episode has done for you is kind of opened your eyes to some of the possibilities out there. Like for instance, I've heard of people and I've been in circles where people are doing everything from. And I'm, I'm sure, we, who knows, we might have an alternative investments episode sometime in the future here. But I've heard people doing everything from uh, creating cell phone towers and renting them out to um, to energy uh, farms where they're, they're, they are putting out solar panels on land to billboards. Like there's ways to make money in, I mean, in so many different ways. But I really love this episode because it mashed together, it mixed together some of Doug's... Um, some parts of his vision with parts of his finances. And so he was able to blend that and, and, he, and he really enjoys it and he, and he loves what he gets to do. And so that's exactly what we want for everybody. And so whatever that looks like for you, run with it. And so we hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, if you uh, liked what you heard, please leave us a review or a rating. We would be great, eternally grateful. Uh, also, if you want to be part of the conversation, head on over to the Life Inner app. It is free. You can download that from the uh, iTunes store. Uh, the Apple Store or the Google Play or you can get the desktop version over at lifeinair.com slash app and we have all kinds of great discussions and conversations regarding anything about anything related to working less, making more and having a great life thanks again uh, on behalf of Life in Air, Peter, myself uh, we value your time and we can't wait to see you on the next episode, take care everyone, have a great day Music